Hello. 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 How are you? Good, thanks. How are you? Good. It's a little bit strange without Sean. Yeah, I wonder where Sean, let me ping Sean. Sorry, I was doing something else. Um, Hey, Sean. Hey. <clears throat> How's everybody doing this morning? Good, how are you? I'm good. For some reason, this meeting was not on my calendar this morning, so sorry I'm late. Dropping the minutes from the last time in here. So <clears throat> I have a pretty light agenda in my mind for our first time back here, but feel free to add uh, any items that you want. Um, maybe I'll just ask if anybody else is going to be at the um, RSC conference in the UK in a couple of weeks. I am not. Um, what days are it? Or what days are it? Is it on? Um, are you, sorry, Sean, are you going to the, the Sweden workshop? I am. Yeah, I'll be in the Sweden workshop. Will you be there too? Yeah, I'll be there as well. It's the week before that. So I don't remember the dates, but it's immediately preceding. Okay. That. Okay. Uh, like uh, side meetings on Monday, the meeting itself, Tuesday through Thursday. I don't think there's anything on Friday. Is that the the research conference or the? The RSE conference, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, the Sweden one, I think, has something on Tuesday, then it's like Wednesday through Friday, if I remember it. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I will not be there. I'm going to be on holiday. That's good too. <laughs> Agreed. Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't think that I have anything other than. I mean, I'm happy to talk about the. The, <coughs> the conference. Yeah. Idea. Yeah. So I was I was looking for the notes from Michelle's email, Dan, and I am I was on the call this morning at four, and I oh, saw that you were you were I saw that you were there earlier in the week. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was on the one that was on I don't know Tuesday or something like that. Yeah, I think it might have been Monday. Could have been Monday as well. Uh, yeah, because I know I couldn't be there because I was teaching. Let me see if so I it had can to be find, Monday. If I can find the notes as well. Yeah, uh, I think I have that. Yep. Okay, so the notes are here. <coughs> oh, good. I found them myself. So <laughs> just as you did. So I will share. I can share my screen. So this idea um, that Dan and I are referring to is. Uh, arises from Michelle Barker, who you may or may not know. Um, Claude, I don't know if you know Michelle Barker. Okay, so she runs an organization called the Research Alliance. Research Software Research Alliance, Research. I believe. Yeah, Research Software Alliance, yeah, RISA. Or RISA, and she has some funding from the Sloan Foundation to work towards an international research software conference. So we have the RSE conference that occurs in, we have one in the US, one in Australia, one in England now. Is that right, Dan? Yeah, one in Germany. There's a kind of a day in the Netherlands. There's a few other things as well. So, yep. Okay. A bunch of different, bunch of different national ones, of which the UK one kind of has a semblance of being international, but it's, yeah. But it is yeah, a pretty strong national focus, let's say. Yeah, and uh, the, the U I think the UK is kind of where this movement towards research software engineers is a job that we need to sustain open source software first emerged from. Am I, am I, do I know that history right, Dan? Or Well, yes and no. So, um, so uh, I think that that certainly is true in the English speaking world. And then it turns out that in the French speaking world, there was a, an earlier activity that was going on and kind of has continued in parallel and is still a little bit separate because of the languages. Okay. And the idea that, you know, they're working towards is, could there be a, a conference that focuses on, I think to some degree, and the group I was in this morning, Dan, it, it, they were struggling with, not struggling, but kind of went back and forth between um, making this sort of idea that Michelle's group has for a conference um, molded from the research software engineering conferences that exist um, and alternately try a few small pilot events to see what might stick. <clears throat> yeah, um, so uh, I can just say that, um, so I'm the steering committee chair for RISA, um, so I'm also kind of involved in it from that side. What, what we ended up getting funding from Sloan for was to, was basically to scope this, uh, to try to, to see if this made sense to do. Right? We, we don't actually have funding to do anything. It's right. funding to potentially plan and, and see if this is, makes sense. And in the, the meeting that I was in the first one, there was also some similar discussion to what you were saying, where um, I would say there was confusion about <coughs> research software conference versus a research software engineering conference. Right. Um, and, and so research software engineering is certainly part of research software, but it's not the only thing that's research software. And uh, yeah, and so then that's, I guess, maybe a, a, a point of discussion. I mean, yeah, this is along with um, when we had our last meeting a month ago, uh, when Mike Haru was on and was talking about the science of research, science, uh, research software. Yeah. Right. That's a, a broader concept than research software engineering as well. And in some ways, I think that what Mike was talking about is more similar to what this kind of research software event might be. 
So no, I haven't. Yeah, I, I sort of am at a deficit because I haven't been to one of these research software engineering conferences. So I don't, I don't have a first, I don't have firsthand knowledge of how closely this is aligned with the research that the research software engineers are doing and how much the scientific enterprise is a, a layer removed from what's being discussed, which, which I think is kind of the question, right? <clears throat> yeah, and, and it kind of depends a little bit on the country as well. Um, so I would say that the US RSE conference is much more focused on kind of day-to-day -day research software engineering work, mm -hmm. um, research software engineering groups, management of research software engineers, software practices, software development and maintenance practices, where the UK one and the German one at least have a little bit, um, go a little bit broader than that. And also look at things like research software sustainability as a, as a topic, which isn't really in the US one very much. Do scientists, do the, do the scientists who are not the software engineers participate in any of these conferences? And do you think it's an aim of this work that some of them might? I think it is. Um, I think this gets back a little bit to the, uh, the dog stool meeting that we had in April. March or April. Um, yeah, earlier this year, which was kind of trying to bring together research software engineers and software engineering researchers. Mm -hmm. um, I think the software engineering researchers in general mostly haven't, well, there, there's kind of a scattering of them that have been at some of the RSE conferences, but it's pretty much a scattering. And, and I would say more, so, again, more so in the UK and the German one and less so in the US one. Um, but if you're talking about researchers in general, then the answer I think is no in all these cases. So no, no, they don't participate now, but that is an aspiration possibly or no. Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't know, actually, that's a good Sorry question. to be dense. <laughs> I, I think like having the software engineering researchers participate would be certainly very important in the event. Uh, that Michelle would like to do. I think having publishers be involved, having funders be involved would also would both be important as well. Um, having people that own repositories, um, archivists, librarians, preservation people. So, so I think there's a lot of kind of groups of stakeholders outside of just RSEs and software engineering researchers that would that ideally we would want to have in a conference. That's quite an eclectic group to think about finding a single place for. Yep. Yeah, I mean, in, in some ways, you could think of it as um, as lots of people that have kind of disciplinary events, and they all are doing something in common. And so do they want to come together to talk about that common thing kind of outside of their their own community and their discipline, and I don't know. How big a conference are you thinking this is going to be? I think that's part of the question. Um, the For what it's worth, the RSE conference, I think the UK one is 400 to 500. The US one will be 350 this year and it's growing. Um, German one was probably 150 maybe, I'm not exactly sure, maybe 200. Um, so I, I would guess something in that size, like a 300 to 500, but it's, uh, it's, it isn't determined at all yet. So I'll just leave, uh, leave this. Link here. I, mean, I think like I was going to say the key thing maybe is on the um, this options paper, which was linked in the original the email notes, but it's it's uh, this, um, and it it basically was kind of starting with the fact that there were these. Uh, <clears throat> These other groups or these other conferences already existed. And, and the question was kind of the fact that they were all 
looking at different aspects of research software, but none of them were really looking at all of research software. If it made sense to try to to do something that that brought all of them together or representatives of all of those communities together. And this, and I guess, sorry, since I'm just seeing you scrolling by, I mean, this also, sorry. no, no, that's okay. Uh, when that conference structure piece, right, says um, that, that this doesn't have oh, to, actually, uh, this wouldn't necessarily have to be an in-person thing that happens once. It could be uh, a series of events, maybe monthly that are virtual. It could be something that's hybrid. Uh, so uh, I think the, the question really was how to, how to bring these different groups and activities together more than we want to have a conference. What should we do in it? Maybe, um, so I guess just as a <clears throat> from me, because I don't actually know the answer, what is, so what does chaos do? Is there a, is there any kind of a chaos event annually? There's a chaos, we have a chaos con that's associated with the FOSDEM conference in Belgium every February. And we have uh, one in North America that's associated with the Open Source Summit, oh, yeah. Open Source Summit in North America, uh, which is anywhere from April to June uh, every year. <clears throat> I actually don't know what month the next one will be. I, I don't think it's been announced yet. I uh, I was just talking to somebody from the LF and she told me June in Denver. Jeez. <clears throat> Random calendar schedule. I guess we're going to go June and then back through May and April every three years or now or what? I think they're struggling to find find venues for the, the yeah. North America conferences that are in places where people will travel. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, I, I guess I, I keep seeing Fosse also. Um, but I keep seeing it like there's a web page for it with a date and then absolutely nothing happens until very, very shortly before it. And so I assume it's not gonna happen and don't plan on it. And then then suddenly it comes together and lots of people seem to go to it. But I don't know, so that seems like an alternative as well. It You're is Fosse it's pretty, so Fosse is a pretty small conference. Um, I, I was there and it's it's probably two, 300 people and it's, it's very hobbyist focused. Um, so it's a little bit okay. different than than a lot of the other conferences. It's very much, I think because it's organized by the Software Freedom Conservancy, it's a very much uh, open source free as in freedom kind of event. Okay. It's not good or bad, that's just the crowd that it draws. Yeah. yeah. And I guess, uh, so I haven't been to Fostum, which I keep kind of thinking about, but it, 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 when I look at it, it seems a little bit scary in terms of like size and number of things going on. Is it, do you feel like the chaos part of it is kind of focused and useful? Well, I guess it must it's be. A, yes. Here's here's the deal with FOSDEM. Um, people go Woodstock. to FOSDEM because everyone everyone is there. Um, the <clears> actual <throat> FOSDEM event itself is massive and chaotic. The real value in going to FOSDEM is all of the events that happen around it. So in our case, there's a uh, chaos con that happens in um, usually on the Thursday before. There's uh, an open forum Europe event that has more policy focused that's on the Friday before. And then starting on like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, um, there are events that happen that following week. So I used to, I was one of the organizers for config management camp, which is probably not relevant for, for you all, but um, then there's state of open con, which also happens usually the Tuesday, Wednesday afterwards that's in, uh, in the UK. So you basically take the train from Brussels to, to London and go to state of open con afterwards. So the, so the, the value in FOSDEM is not FOSDEM itself. It's all of the stuff that happens around it and the networking that is generated by having that many people. Because realistically, you, you often can't get in the rooms to see the talks that you want to see because there are so many people. It is like Woodstock for software engineers, though. I mean, it kind in terms of, of the, 
atmosphere. It's very, it, it, you know, to get software engineers there, I think would be an easy thing to do. If you go to conferences for the hallway talks, FOSDEM yeah. is the conference for you. Yeah. Because that's where everything happens. Yeah. Okay. Did that, uh, so I guess, uh, Sean, did that come up in the, in the RISA hall that you were on this morning? It, it didn't, but only because I didn't think of it and probably others weren't aware of it. Uh, but I'll probably join the third call this afternoon, like at three. <clears throat> I think it is. Because I, I, I did want to talk to this group before, ideally, uh, because I think this group, I mean, obviously, Dan, you're already part of it, but Claude and Don bring good perspectives. And I think <clears throat> co-locating with FOSDEM would make a lot of sense. Michelle's also shared with me uh, some of the conversations she's having with the Linux Foundation. And I think uh, we might have an easier time getting space at an open source summit in North America or an open source summit Europe. One of the things we struggle with with ChaosCon is we're kind of responsible for finding our own location in that general FOSDEM area. <clears throat> but in when we affiliate or work with the Linux Foundation, they've been super good about helping us find space, in some cases even subsidizing it. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so logistically, it may be easier to to try to associate with an LF conference. <clears throat> okay. Um, I think that, so as far as I understand, the third meeting will be um, on Monday next week at 6 a.m. Central Time. Oh, okay. <clears throat> I'm probably misremembering, sorry. <clears throat> okay. Um, yeah, yeah, you're I, right. Uh, you're right. Okay. Um, yeah, so maybe, I mean, that might be interesting potentially to think about. Yeah, I, um, I don't know. I mean, I guess kind of how, I guess what, um, from the point of view of chaos and in particular this, I don't know, the, this kind of science part of it, what connections make sense to make to other research software activities? Um, as opposed to kind of more wide open source, where clearly you already have lots of connections and are, don't really need to do anything differently. I mean, I guess maybe that's a Sorry, maybe that's a different uh, kind of a question. All is that, um, in some sense, these meetings kind of started because, uh, at least partly because of the um, the Corsa project and, and Greg kind of reaching out and having a need to do things around metrics for research software with a DOE focus. Yeah, and they seem to have disappeared. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, so then that's what I was wondering. It's like, what? Yeah, how do we? I think, I, yeah, maybe going forward, Dan, I should reach out to Greg. I don't know if you are in regular contact with him and just see if if they still, if he and Addy still have interest or <clears throat> if maybe they've got what they needed. I don't, yeah, I don't think so. That's, I'm a little bit actually puzzled by um, why they seem to have dropped off recently. Well, <clears throat> I mean, it, for the, for the most part, oh. a lot of the chaos meetings, we struggle to get participants in June, July, and August, and things pick back up again in the fall. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. The other thing is Oak Ridge. It tends to follow the University of Tennessee's calendar because it's so close. So I think they have a lot of like slower periods and people on vacation in the summer like many of us do. Um, you know that I don't disagree with you in general, but we've been having regular meetings every Monday on that project. And okay, so. okay, yeah. Uh, do you want me to reach out to Greg and Addy, or do you want to just do it in the course of your regular interactions, Dan? I'm I think cool actually, it'd, be, it'd probably be helpful if both of us do because we'll we'll do it okay. in different. I think. All right. Yeah, I'll reach out to Greg and Addy right after we're done here today. Then. And I know they had one of their major consultant 
people here as well, but Greg and Addie are the ones I think I've talked with the most and kind of know to reach out to. Right. I mean, so maybe if I just kind of go back um, to the reason I was asking that, it's. Um, should we keep up the meetings? I think it's. Well, it's, it's probably should we keep up the meetings, but it's partly like what, from the point of view of chaos, what do you what do you want to do in terms of research software? Mm -hmm. Right. This. So the. It, it's like it's it's a, a side interest, and if there are people that want to participate in it, that's great, and you'll put in a little bit of effort to help them. Is it something that's like. An effort so what an area where chaos maybe has hasn't participated and wants to do more right so i guess I'm, I'm just trying to understand like how strongly kind of you're interested in this and how much of it is kind of outside driven versus internal so i i can so the origin story and then there's my own personal interest the origin story is that these scientific software topics were coming up in the university research software group but the university research discussion group is really mostly comprised of the folks who are funded by Sloan to create OSPOs at universities. And so that is a very specific interest. And their, their questions and concerns are largely around how to provide credit to researchers, academics for the work of research software, how to measure that and report it to the universities, and then really either tech transfer or regulatory compliance questions about it um, drive the discussion. And I think the kinds of conversations we have here are more about sustainability of the larger research and scientific software enterprise beyond any one institution. So all the folks in that other group are really focused inwardly on their own institutions. And I think we're focused across disciplines. So that's the origin story. My personal interest is you know, I've been doing a lot of analysis of, and this is where I'd I think like six weeks ago or eight weeks ago, I, I'd kind of come with this idea of generating some research outputs through this group, like actually constructing research on scientific open source uh, together. And so I'm, that's why I'm kind of hoping to reignite conversations with Greg and Addy personally, uh, because I think they have good ideas and, under, and would understand some of the computational modeling my students are doing and some of the questions that we're trying to ask about you know, how do we how do we figure out or answer sustainability questions around scientific open source because they're the, the quantitative statistical modeling part of it, it is very very different than it is in a corporatized open source setting and so my, my own interest is to understand better how how to evaluate research software sustainability knowing that it doesn't look anything like the corporate side, at least quantitatively and computationally. Yeah, and I think I think part of the purpose of having having working groups like this is that it it helps us have have conversations about how certain contexts are different and, and what people need. Because historically the chaos project has been the, the sweet spot's really been corporate OSPOs because those tend to be the people who've used uh, a lot of our tools in the past. And so part of the reason for spinning up context specific working groups like the scientific one, the university one, is, is that it does help us understand how different groups use the metrics differently and what's important to different types of you know, types of groups. So, you know, what's important for, for the scientific software space is something that I think it's important for chaos to care about. So that's, I, I would say that's probably why I've been most interested in this group. Yeah, okay. and I think Dan, some, some of my, my, some of my experiences with uh, working with CCI going back like seven years now, um, I'll be honest, I'm not sure they're approaching it right. I don't, I don't, I'm not, and not I think, sure that, sorry, that, that CZI is approaching it, right? Yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not sure that they're doing more than funding the already rich projects. I don't hmm. think they've done a very complete job of looking around the edges. I think they've kind of funded the easy winners 
And I'm interested in finding these, these smaller, because I think most scientific, mo like the largest weight of scientific software maintenance work occurs around the long tail, that the big projects that have largely been funded by CZI, like their NumPies, your NumFocus, is not like any of that's wrong. Um, and they have funded some long tail projects, but I do think there's a, most of the weight in open source scientific software is not on the biggest projects. I think most of it is these smaller projects and sustaining individual or small consortiums of labs. <clears throat> and so okay. it's, a, it's a different question. It's not, and that's not a criticism of CCI because yeah. these big yeah. projects do need to be funded, but I, and I guess I said they were wrong, but it sounds like a criticism, but I don't, I don't mean it that way. I'm just coarse in my language. Um, I just, I just mean that understanding sustainability and open source scientific software, I think is a more complex uh, endeavor that has more tentacles and fewer resources than the corporatized side. Yeah, that's, um, sorry. So I'm, I'm quite interested in that because it, in some ways it partly matches some of the things that I was trying to do at NSF when I was funding research software projects, mm -hmm. um, where we're basically, a, in some ways I felt like I had a trade-off. And so I, I think this is kind of similar to what CZI is facing in that, right? There are, there are big projects that are used by large fractions of the community. And you know that investing in them is going to help and then there's kind of the right, the long tail, as you were saying, where it's almost impossible actually to support because there's so much of a need. And there's so many. There's, there's so, so many, many, like exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And no, I yeah, I really meant so many as opposed to individual need. Um, yeah. So it seemed like the, the thing there was not to support them individually, but to try to do things that made the ecosystem better overall. Um, I which think I, that's smart. Which seems yeah. actually doing so much of, and Sloan is doing more of, which is actually interesting. Um, but uh, sorry, in any case, kind of going back to this, then uh, maybe a question is like, what, what, how does how do metrics tie into this, and what do they, how do they help us kind of figure out what to do, or make decisions, or help the ecosystem? I don't know. Yeah. So, so what I've learned, what I what I think I learned in my engagement with CZI over the years is is that scientists are very different like um, in the corporatized space there's it's almost a given that people understand the value of forming a foundation and a common umbrella for similar software and in my talk talking with the scientists not so much the big projects but the other scientists funded by CZI there seemed to be a an active resistance to the notion of any kind of shared problem or a shared foundation like there's they're just people didn't want to be part of a larger group innately not not to a name but i felt more like my, my interactions and conversations were directed more there where it didn't seem like they really wanted a shared boat or to recognize the shared concerns and so i think there's a long way of saying that i think metrics and perhaps some computational models that demonstrate similarity of projects quantitatively and uh, empirically uh, can help to communicate with scientists about where their shared interests might might exist um, dependency analysis for example some of the things that we do around dependencies i think i suspect anyway that a lot of scientists with this open source software debt or thing that they're working on uh, don't really have any visibility into the things that they depend on or how they rely on a larger ecosystem. So I think to the extent that their interconnectedness with others can be made visible, I think metrics are useful to the extent that the, the common characteristics of the challenges they face can be surfaced and made visible. Uh, it's, it's helpful. So there, because there's not in my, conversations again I don't claim to be right uh, there's not a recognition of what is shared or what our interconnectedness might be and so I think where chaos can come in with metrics is to try to help make those things visible like I don't think we solve anything but I think we might help make things visible 
Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, so I, maybe I'm, I'll just say I've um, so I've also been involved in the discussions that Michelle has been having with uh, Linux Foundation and, and CZI, and I don't want to get into any of that here, but it's um, yeah, I, I will say it's been interesting to see the different uh, perceptions of the of these different communities and and, they, and it, as you say, kind of how different they are. Um, I, I guess one thing. I don't know that I'm thinking about, and I don't know if this, I, again, I don't know how this gets into metrics exactly, is that it seems to me often that people in the commercial world that are working on software are working on it kind of for a means, uh, for an end. Yes. And, and they're not necessarily so concerned about being identified with the software itself, where people in academia are more at least in part, working on their own reputation as much as their scientific results, and and the the software is part of that, and and they don't want to lose that. That's a good that's a good point. The, the there's more ownership from if I've got scientific software emerging from my lab, I. I have a harder time letting that go because my reputation might be associated with it. <clears throat> yeah, I think, yeah, I think it's the reputation side of it as much as anything, as much as the pure ownership. Do you, so I, I just have to ask, because I, I think sometimes I'm just different. I, I don't think, like for example, I maintain Augur and I don't feel like anybody in my field cares if Augur is any good or not, or used or not. Like it, I don't feel like it touches my scientific reputation at all. But am I wrong, or is that just is it just a different field, or am I just weird? I don't. I guess I don't have a good answer for yeah. you. I mean, I think there are, I think there are people that are that are specifically known for a software product. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and. And then there are other people that are known for research and the software isn't kind of as important to them, the specific software. So I, I see, I, I see what you're saying is yeah. now in the life science, is this, I guess, I don't know, you don't have all the answers, Dan, I recognize that I, I can see, like, I think in the life sciences, there are certainly labs in the, you know, scientists who are associated with particular pieces of software that are especially useful for some purpose and like, you know, just to share a University of Missouri story, we had a software, I forget, it was a life science thing with genomic mapping that was publicly available and somehow it got hacked and just disappeared. And the scientist here responsible for that didn't like it, that that, that happened to, to the software that they maintained. I mean, it's, it's uh, I don't know, that kind of thing, or I'm randomly mambling now. Yeah, I, uh, good to keep I, in mind. Right, I, I was going to say, like, I think um, I don't know. So, so this isn't well. I, I, I won't use any example because I don't think I could do this in a fair way because I don't understand the area well enough. But I think that my suspicion is that there are people in life sciences who are known for a software package, mm -hmm. um, and they and that's really their kind of their job and their career in some sense is creating those mm -hmm. tools, those methods rather than, than the scientific results. Mm -hmm. Whereas there are other people that are completely on the opposite side and probably people that are more in the middle. Yeah. And, and, and I think that- I don't know how to measure any of that though, which would no, also- I don't either. Because if we can, I mean, in some ways, if we can understand why somebody felt ownership or how much that tied to their identity or something else that would actually potentially be useful in terms of thinking about how to, uh, how to work towards more group packages or collective packages. So that's, I mean, it's just more of like a, 
kind of sociological. Yeah. yeah this no, is I'm, awesome. this I'm imagining an interview study uh, would be necessary. A very large scale field study would be required to actually get to the bottom of that. <laughs> Possibly some psychological instruments. I mean, Dan, you had some, I think some of these questions uh, emerged from your head. Uh, do you have others? Um, well, I mean, I, so I guess I, I have kind of one that, uh, let's, let's just call it a theoretical question at this point, which is, um, so if, like, if you were CZI, what would you do differently? And how would you demonstrate that doing something differently would be better for the community? Sorry, that's not intended to be an easy question. No, it's not an easy, it's not, it's not an easy question, I think. Um, to say what I'd do differently if I was CZI, I think I would need more visibility into how the gears turn inside what is the black box to me. So surely there's a rationale behind how they choose what to support today and uh, probably even a philosophy. Uh, so I haven't been able to tease that out by observing what they fund other than the, my earlier observation about a lot of large scale visible projects and not as much of the long tail. So I won't say this necessarily for CZI, but I'll say that my experience with philanthropic funders who have become interested in research software is that they see a need from the researchers that they're funding. Mm -hmm. And they often use that to that often exposes the, the role of research software to them, and then they can use that at least as a step in determining what research software they're going to be funding. And I, I think this is actually, it's in some ways, it's kind of true for government funders as well. Like for, for DOE, it's, it's the software that's needed to, to fulfill its mission for NSF. It's the software that's needed to support the the researchers that NSF is also funding. Mm -hmm. um, I think for NASA, it's kind of similar to DOE. So I, I think, yeah, I, I guess um, I'm not sure that any of the funders are funding software because they just want to fund software. It seems like they're almost all funding it because it's they've decided that it's important to do for their mission, whether that mission is something specific or or as a set of researchers that get selected through some other means. Yeah, I don't disagree. I don't disagree with that at a high level. I think that, you know, looking from the outside looking in, I think I think it's easier for like a DOE to make a choice because they have certain machines that need to turn. Uh, and yeah. then when you get when you get to NSF um, or a foundation I do think, I think really the, the person who I think understands the general role of software from the perspective of technology the best is Josh Greenberg at Sloan. Like I think he is definitely not funding software to support some larger research enterprise. He's funding things like chaos and these university ospos because there's a fundamental recognition that technology and software specifically is central to the scientific enterprise. So. He's coming at it for sure from this knowing perspective. And I think, I think you're right about other funders that they're trying to assess probably what software do I need to fund so that my other science can happen. If I'm not hearing what you said. Right. I mean, so that if that is, if that's the case in general, and I agree with you that Josh kind of having a, uh, a technology program is a little bit different in some sense. Um, but for the others, we could then think about, I don't know, kind of a, some some multi-stage metric driven activity where we're trying to understand what software actually is important for what science. 
and kind of the dependency analysis, but not just dependencies of not just dependencies of software, but dependencies of science, um, which then would go through further down into dependencies of software. And then uh, kind of a further piece would be if we if we knew that, could we understand the sustainability of, of the, all that software and figure out where we would recommend investments going? All right, this is a this is a key piece of software for these big science areas, and it's in danger of failing. Or this is a something that's important only to a couple of people, and it has no danger of failing, and so we don't need to do anything. Or something in the middle, which would get much more complicated. And that also then could lead into things that would be um, more kind of cultural changes or systematic changes. And if we could, I don't know, if we could get people to use better practices in writing software initially, could we then measure the effect of that on the science that comes out? I don't know, sorry. So this is all like very- uh, I'm just writing down on this stream of consciousness there. Yeah. Again, I'm, I'm I mean, just, these, these I'm are all thinking. questions that are fundamentally interesting to me. And so, yeah. Yeah, I, I guess I, I'm just trying to think about again, if if we assume that, the, that there's a goal of like of better science and, and that software is part of what makes science happen, then what are the different parts of that that we could investigate or improve or experiment with? And I guess part uh, part of the reason I'm saying this is I feel like this is kind of what I've been doing over the last I don't know seven to ten years and twelve years, but just focused on kind of very specific pieces of it, and not really focusing on it in a general way. And maybe maybe one way of thinking about um, uh, a research software event, kind of going back to where we started at the beginning of this, would be. How do we bring all these individual things together? I agree. Um, if, if you're not able to be at the meeting on Monday, I'll bring some of these ideas uh, with me to it. It will be an easier meeting to be awake for than the one at 4 a.m. today. Yeah, sorry, I, I have a hard time doing anything before seven. I can I can do things yeah. later in the evening, but early mornings are, are just tougher. Yeah, person. yeah no, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a late nighter. I used to be a morning person, but now I'm very much late night. I think uh, living with teenagers has had an effect on me. I'm surprised it seems like your time hour. zone, you'll be whatever hour you want to be early, late, middle of the afternoon. Pick your right time zone. Temporally flexible, Claude is. <clears throat> well, you know, I often find that I'm working on Australian time because why not? <laughs> <laughs> Aren't you in Europe, though? I am. No, I okay. don't work on Australian time. I, well, I, I do start early. So maybe I am. I don't know. You know. Uh, Australia, Australia seems to touch both ends of my day. So. All right, well, we're actually at time. Uh, I think this has been a really good discussion. Uh, the biggest, I think Dan and I have an action item to reach out to Greg and Addie. I've been wondering, yeah. I've been wondering I did, here, uh, sorry, is there I was... a difference, is there a difference in perception between the different, different groups of developers? Now, see, you were talking about, you know, science developers and business, corporate development and I think there's open source development separate from all of that because I think that they're, I don't know, I haven't done that much science uh, programming to be honest, um, but the the corporate stuff is always, you know, you, the, most of those people are, you go to work and you just leave it there when you're done for the day. And the open source people have a little more, 
investment in in making sure the software works and knowing that their name's associated with it. It's just sort of it's just assumed that your name is associated with it in some way. And I'm wondering I think that science might fall someplace in between that. Um, so, and then I just, I, I'm not sure. And then the other question mm. that I'm wondering about is, um, there's the Cyber Resiliency Act in Europe, which talks about putting things on the market, right? That's sort of the a gating piece. And I'm wondering if scientific software, where it falls within that range of, of, of software that they talk about. Um, and if there's a perception that, you know, I'm, I'm working on this scientific project and so the, all the code that, that I'm writing for that, while it's open source, it's really, I'm not open sourcing it. I'm more concerned with just writing it for my project and I don't really care what any other project is doing. Even if they're doing something that's very similar, I'm not looking at their software saying, how can we make it better? How can we make them, you know, merge them together and you know, grow it organically. I think it's more, you're more focused on the one thing. So it's almost as though it's a closed environment for the scientific project itself. And there are probably exceptions to that, but that, that's my perception. Um, anyway. I'm thinking, I'm, I'm taking that in and thinking about it, Claude. I figured I'd give that to you just before we finished so that you could have yeah. a whole month to think about it. Hey, maybe I will just say quickly that um, the way you, the description that you gave at the beginning with um, kind of corporate and, and open source and research software, I, I think you're where you put open source and research software is kind of the opposite of or the order that I would have put them in, which is probably interesting to think about as well. So do you think that the research software has more, people are more invested in having their name associated with it or? I, I think, yeah, I, often I do. Um, okay. I do, I have to admit, a friend, I was had dinner with a friend of mine and he was like, I, he's got all these things up on Git and he's talking about, it. he can't get any credit for all this stuff that's up there. And I said, well, you know, Git has this thing where you can, it tells people how to cite your code at least. And, and yeah. he didn't know about that. So and I, I'll have to go talk to him some more, see what he says about other things. but. Yeah, I mean, I do think this would be a good discussion to continue. So, okay, I will. Uh, I'll put it um, as the is the discussion research software and corporate software differences. Uh, is that a good and open source? Because I think open source is is different yet again. There, yeah. Dan, would you phrase the topic scope differently? No, I think that's fine. Okay. Um, I mean, again, just from the point of view of us doing this in this group, then I think one uh, question would be how how do we, I don't know, are, uh, are there measurable things that we could use in this or are we just kind of talking in generalities? Or does this, does this drive us to any metrics or does it does it drive us to different metrics for different cases or the same metrics with different values? I, so, I mean, one of the things I would love to have a discussion about is if we can like name a space and identify projects related to it, uh, I'd love to do some collaborative modeling of like, uh, I know Dan, you'd have, you don't necessarily do this yourself, but you're certainly knowledgeable about what it means to understand patterns that, that could be discerned from a, a statistical model or a computational model about how projects that we know to have been sustained at the same scale, what, what are their properties? What are the properties of the software we have questions about? Um, how are they different to the same? None of it's prescriptive, but I think it could, I think we can lend visibility. And I, I'm interested in doing something specific, not only talking about it philosophically. Yeah, I, well, I'll say that I'm, I'm also very interested in and that in doing something about it, I'm just not, not, I personally don't feel like I'm the right person to do it, but I'm very happy to collaborate with other people on it. Um, it also, it also fits into, um, it fits into uh, the, the ERSI policy work that I'm doing that's Sloan funded, which is 
this at a high level. Um, I'm trying to. I feel like there should be something. Yeah, actually, this is really interesting. Yeah, sorry. Um, there's we have a GitHub thing that's got a bunch of, a bunch of issues, and they're basically issues that we think would be interesting research. Some of which are like could be a student project for a for a quarter. Some could be like a multi-year, multi-person activity. And um, and I think what you described actually is one of those. Um, this this question about studying repositories and trying to understand the, the differences between sustainable projects and and others. More projects that have been sustained than others. Um, I'm just trying to. Okay. I'm going to have to run here, but I just yeah. the thought just occurred to me that the in the open source community, there's this idea of a meritocracy, right? Which means that the, the assumption is that you become known in the in the open source community. Right? So that means that people know your work. So it's important. In a meritocracy to for people to know what what you've done which i think is very much a similar to what the problem is with the, the scientific sort of code in that you want people to know that you've done it you want that uh, that recognition so i think it's very, they're very similar in that respect um and i just i don't know how to phrase that but i think that's that's something to consider anyway I need to drop. Um, I yeah, I you. got another meeting myself. But, uh, this has been a really good discussion. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Bye, everybody. Make a, make okay. a note of the issues there. Bye, everyone.